All right, it's a good picture. Good picture there, the narrow door. Yeah, that's a different guy. All right, yeah, you know who this is? How many of you know who that man is? Uh, Ray, Ray, no, seriously. Is that all the people that know who that is? That, that is Stephen Wright. Now, it's, it's a pretty recent picture. You now you know who it is. Uh, uh, Stephen Wright is a comedian. He employs uh, an unusual style, okay? A deadpan style of delivery that uh, gives a sort of a bizarre form of humor. A lot of what he does is ask questions, and here are some of the questions that Stephen Wright will ask. If you're sending uh, someone styrofoam as a gift, what do you package it in? If a cow laughed, would milk come out her nose? So what is the speed of dark? And, and you see, when you listen to these kind of things, uh, understand that you, your brain has to kind of go into a different mode. And I find it has a collective effect on me. I listen to these, about six or seven into them, I really start cracking up. And then each one becomes more funny than, than the last one. Here's a few more. Where do forest rangers go to get away from it all? Do jellyfish get gas from jelly beans? And finally, how do you write zero in Roman numerals? Yeah, great questions. Aren't these great questions? I'd like some answers to that, but those are not the most practical ones that you could ask. These are just speculative questions. These are theoretical, and today we're going to read from the Gospels an account of someone asking Jesus a question somewhat like that. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 13. By the way, I should note, you might have noticed the pulpit isn't here. Did you notice the pulpit wasn't here? Huh? Okay. So, so here I am. I'm 40, I'm 40 years into this preaching business. I've been preaching one month short of 40 years, pretty much 47 Sundays a year, right? And, uh, but I'm learning new things. I've learned to use the iPad. You know, I've learned to walk around a little bit, not hide behind the pulpit. But as people talk to me, they said, Dan, we want to see more of you. <laughs> I don't understand that, but that's what the kids were asking for. Uh, you like that? <laughs> so, uh, so I'm getting used to not having a pulpit today, and we'll see how it goes. It's an experiment and uh, not, not sure if I'm going to like this or you're going to like this, but uh, the word is the same. I've been preaching the same message for 40 years. The pulpit and the uh, notes and all of that somewhat different. Uh, and the, the, the equipment uh, around my ears and on my lapel, uh, all that's gone through some changes. But the same word, and that, uh, for that we're very grateful. Luke chapter 13, verse 22. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head, <coughs> once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. Verse 22 that we read says Jesus was passing through from one city to another. And as Jesus was doing that, he had this traveling ministry of teaching and, of course, performing miracles. He was the rabbi on the go, and the place he was going was Jerusalem, and he was going to Jerusalem in order to die, but his trip south to Jerusalem became for him his final missionary journey as he proceeded slowly from one city unto the next, teaching his disciples and presumably teaching many others at the same time. It was at this time in some unknown city that some unidentified person asked him the question recorded in verse 23, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? Interesting. 
Now, I have a hunch that it, I, had I been one of the 12 disciples, I, I might have been the chief inquirer. I might have been uh, Captain Q, so to speak. There's all kind of questions I would have loved to put to Jesus. I would have craved to get his answer on any number of topics. Not at the top of my list, but certainly on it would be this question asked right here. How many people, Lord, are really saved? That's what the inquirer wants to know. And he seems to have a hunch that uh, only a few will make it, but his question seeks from Jesus a statement on the number of the redeemed. Now, I find that to be an interesting question. That's, uh, that's, that's point one. We only have two today. An interesting question and an important answer. Got that? Interesting question, important response. For now, think with me about the question. And what is it you suppose provoked the question? Why was this person interested? I, I really can't be sure about this, but... Um, there are some people, who, who, it's the type of question that sometimes gets asked by the religious trifler. You know what I mean by that? There's a breed of humans who seem to think that the only purpose of religion is to provide us with some interesting subjects for speculation. They'll be glad to talk with you about religious issues, toss around some ideas about them. If you change the subject to politics or to movies or sports or whatever, they'll go there with you uh, to talk in the same fashion. Talk, you know, it's easy, but involvement, these are the kind of people that can do without the actual involvement. They are triflers, and possibly it was idle curiosity that led to this question. Possibly, too, it was the teaching of Jesus that had stirred the man's mind. He had listened to what Jesus had to say about the cost of discipleship, about the life of righteousness, and it got him thinking that if this is what it means to be saved, <laughs> then as he can see it, not many folks will qualify. His question then becomes a way of clarifying. He tells Jesus that if he is hearing him correctly, then he would assume the number of the saved actually to be relatively few. And so he says, is that true, Jesus? Am I reading this correctly? So what do you think about the question? You ever asked this question? <laughs> I know I have. I can very much relate to this question, if indeed it was prompted by the teaching of Jesus, because I've had, I've had the exact same reaction to the Gospels. I'll read some of the statements that Jesus makes in the Gospels, like no man can serve God in money. I hear him say you must love the Lord more than you love your own family. I hear him say that you must hunger and thirst after righteousness. And, and then I look around and I find those people that seem to fit that description to be, to be quite few. And this Reality hit me very hard as a, as a young believer, really coming to see what the Scriptures taught that a true Christian was. The more I learned, the more I realized that even in the church, the truly converted were apparently in the minority. So am I saying that the answer to the question is yes, there are only a few who are being saved? Is that what I'm saying? No. No, my feeling about who is and is not being saved can, it can shift from day to day almost. The plain fact is, I don't know about the population of heaven, the population of hell. And, and the response Jesus makes to this question doesn't actually solve my particular puzzling. I, I, how does Jesus answer this? Well, he doesn't answer it directly at all. He says two things here that some feel hint at the answer, but those things, they sort of seem contradictory. First, he responds by saying the door is narrow, which suggests that only a relative few will be in. But then later in verse 29, he speaks of people coming from north and south and east and west to join in the heavenly feast. And, and that's a word picture, which implies a great multitude, doesn't it? It seems clear from Scripture and from my experience, that the number of the saved will be tremendous. The descendants of Abraham will be as the, what did he say? As the stars of the heavens, as the sand of the seashores. But at the same time, Scripture and experience also tell me that the clear majority of humanity throughout the ages were not and are not saved. In Matthew 7, it says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are, what's the word there? Many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are, key word, few who find it. So, wow, that seems pretty clear. 
And uh, in my observation, it confirms my observations as well. The question itself about the number of the saved, it's interesting, it's understandable, but Jesus points our attention in another direction, and that's where I want to take us now. So the Lord was asked a speculative question, but responds with something quite different. He responds with a command. When asked about the number of the saved, he simply says to his inquirer, strive to enter through the narrow door. The answer from Jesus is no answer. Instead, his response indicates that such speculation is likely to take your attention off of what should be your primary concern, which is making sure that all is well with your own soul. It's as if your teenager comes to you and says, hey, Dad, how many 15-year-olds will fuss at their mama today? And you look at your teenager and say, I don't know how many 15-year-olds will fuss at their mama today, but you make sure you're not one of them. That's the idea. That's how this comes off. In his book, A Preface to Christian Theology, John McKay illustrated two kinds of interest in Christian things by picturing persons sitting on the high front balcony of a Spanish home watching travelers go by on the road underneath the balcony, and the balconiers can overhear the travelers talk. They can even chat with the travelers, they they may comment critically on the way that the travelers walk, or they may discuss questions about the road, you know, how the road can exist, where the road came from, where it leads to, what might uh, be seen from different points along the road, and so forth. But they are, those people on the balcony, they're onlookers, you understand, and their problems are theoretical only, whereas the travelers, by contrast, face problems which... uh, Though they have their theoretical angles, are essentially practical problems of which way to go and how to make it, those type of problems, which call not merely for comprehension, but for decision and for action as well. Balconiers and travelers, they may think over the same area, yet their problems, their problems differ. For example, the problem of evil, how about that one? problem of evil is one of the great perplexities that man has ever wrestled with, and, and we have wrestled with this for centuries, some from a secular perspective, others from a Jewish or Christian or Muslim perspective, and it's okay to wonder about how evil came to be, but what is vastly more important than speculating about evil, how can there be evil in a world created by, by a good God? And, and what is also more likely to be solved than the theoretical is to overcome the evil that is within your own heart and within your own life. Don't just discuss the problem. Do something about the problem. Some of you like to talk about history. Some of you like to talk about current events, future trends. And you can read all sorts of predictions for the future. Nothing wrong with that stuff. But what is far more important than talking about the future and what may be is to help shape the future, right? It's better to make history than to study history. Now, you can argue that studying history will help you make history. That's fine. But you want to make history. That's more important than studying the history. I think you get the point. And Jesus here says to his inquirer, that what should occupy his attention, it's not so much the number in heaven, but it's his own presence there. I think of the song, When the Saints Go Marching In. Yeah, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. That's the idea, when the saints go marching in. That's the real pressing issue which Jesus draws to our attention. Shall we shift our focus from the interesting question to the important response which Christ offers? So the response here we're given, it's, it's not a theoretical answer, it's a command. Strive to enter by the narrow door. These, uh, the two outstanding words here, the word strive and the word narrow, right? Strive and narrow. You may be bothered by the word strive. I, I, I don't know. Jesus clearly is speaking to this person about how to be saved, and the verb he picked which tells him what to do is a verb that describes great effort. Strive, make every effort. The Greek word, in fact, is the verb agonizo. 
<laughs> and you can hear in that, in that word that it, it's our, the word from which we get our English, agonize. If, you, if you're with me in believing that salvation is of grace through faith apart from any human works, well, you may find it hard to square this verse with that theology. So I want to come back to this term because I believe it can only be understood in the light of in the light of the narrow door. So let's think about that. Jesus says, strive to enter by the narrow door. Not just any door, but a particular door which he calls the narrow door. It's implied here that there are other doors. Elsewhere, Jesus speaks a little more thoroughly on this subject of the doors. In Matthew 7, he speaks of entering the narrow gate, which surely is just a different angle on the same idea. Matthew 7, 13, do we have that again, Linda? Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Many enter through it. The gate is small. The way is narrow that leads to life. Few find it. So this verse, I think, helps us out, helps us understand our text. The tra- you're a traveler, and you must choose your road. And what, above all else, should determine your choice of roads? Think about that. What among all else should determine the choice of the road that you take? It is, it should be obvious, your destination, right? Where are you trying to go? In the teaching of Christ on the two ways, he tells you two things about the ways. He tells you about their width and their direction. But anybody knows that the most important criteria of a road is where it will take you. In, uh, in Alice in Wonderland, there's that moment where Alice comes to a place uh, where there's uh, a multitude of roads she can take, the road divides, and there's the Cheshire cat, and she asks the cat, which road should I take? And the cat wisely responds, where is it you want to go? And her response is, I don't know, to which he says, then it doesn't matter <laughs> which road you take. If direction is irrelevant, well, you may as well pick your road according to its size, according to its color, according to anything else you like. But if, you, if I want to get from here to Cranberry, my choices become a bit more limited, don't they? <laughs> I, I may prefer driving on uh, Interstate 376. It is broader than Highway 19, fewer traffic lights, but it won't help me get to Cranberry. Jesus suggests to us that if you don't mind going to everlasting death, then you are free to take the broad spiritual gate and the broad spiritual road. But if you want eternal life, then there is only one way. There's only one way. Now, this teaching of our Lord, it is diametrically opposed to the prevalent ideas in our society, isn't it? As most people see it, there are many roads that lead to heaven, many roads to God. That's what you hear. Does that sound like what Jesus taught? Say no, no, (laughs) no. Quite different. Jesus said the way of life is narrow. The way to life is narrow. Most say it's quite broad. A survey by U.S. Catholic magazine revealed that 93% of Americans believe in heaven, 83% say they are confident they're going to go there. And not only that, uh, the, the survey shows that we expect almost everybody to make it into heaven. Asked whether they thought Saddam Hussein, it's an old poll, so the former murderous Iraqi dictator would make it. Only 12% said Saddam would, uh, would not make it into eternal life. Only 5% thought that uh, founder of Playboy, the Playboy Inter- uh, Enterprise, Hugh Hefner, would not make it to heaven. Hitler rated the highest number who thought he would burn. That was 22% thought Adolf Hitler would not make it into heaven. But that just confirms what I expected, that we are very broad-minded when it comes to these things. Is this changing? I think this may be changing somewhat, but one of our cultural commitments for some time has been, you, you don't criticize my trip and I won't criticize yours. My road's okay, your road's okay. Christian, let me say it plainly, our devotion to Jesus Christ will set you squarely against that kind of thinking. 
No matter how you slice it, the Christian faith is narrow in some very important ways. We do not grant that just any faith or any lifestyle is acceptable. Our master thought, taught that the path of life or the path to life, it is a narrow one, and that the way of exclusive devotion to him is that path. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the door, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I'm mirroring Jesus at that point. Now, now you might think, that's awfully narrow. And, and I agree, that is awfully narrow. Christ said the way to life is narrow. And I'm willing to be that, I'm willing to be that narrow-minded, which is one of the worst things you can be called in our particular culture, but I will put up with that rap because I would rather send men and women down a narrow road to life than a broad road that leads to destruction. When your doctor discovers a mass of cancer in your colon and says that you must have surgery quickly or you might die, will you look at your doctor and say, why, doctor, that is awfully narrow-minded. I think I'll go to another doctor who doesn't take such a dogmatic approach. You might get a second opinion, but I hope not for that reason. When your life is at stake, you want a doctor that's going to tell it like it is, not someone who's afraid you won't like the news he has to bring. Jesus tells it like it is. He said, the way to life is narrow. Are you willing to bet that he's wrong on this one? So we're dealing here with an analogy, right? You know that Jesus isn't talking about going through any physical or material doors, but do you know what he is talking about? What is this door or this gate that he's talking about? It's something you must get through to get to some place you want to go. To secure salvation or eternal life, you're told you must enter through something. What is that? What is the door? In another place, Jesus helps us with this answer, John 10, verse 9. Read it together with me. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Wow, that's, that's good, simple, basic gospel, right? Jesus is the door, the narrow door. And in what sense is Jesus narrow? He is narrow in that to go through him demands an allegiance to him that is exclusive and it is total. Now, I sought for a good way to illustrate this, and I found the analogy of marriage most fitting. The believer is joined to Jesus as a woman is joined to a man in marriage. When you marry someone, you are committing yourself unreservedly. There's going to be this exclusive allegiance. And there I go using the word exclusive again. It goes along with narrow. A marriage commitment is a very narrow thing. When you get married, you vow that forsaking all others, you will cling to that one man, that one woman alone until death. Marriage is a narrow thing in that it involves an exclusive devotion. And in the same way, Jesus presents a narrow way to eternal life. So what that means is that when you enter through this door, there's a bunch of things that you have to leave behind. going off script here, but I could just imagine a bride coming down the aisle, and as she comes down the aisle, she's dropping things behind her. <laughs> These are things I'm leaving behind as I'm coming to enter into this marriage. That would be an interesting picture of what's going on in a wedding. Picture in your mind's eye a very narrow door, and you're trying to get through that narrow door carrying a sofa. Some of you have done this. The sofa will not fit through the door. The door is too narrow. What are your options? Well, okay, I, got, I know what some of you are thinking. Cut off the legs. No, 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 no. Let's keep it simple, okay? <laughs> Just an analogy. Your options, either you stay outside of the door with the sofa, or you can enter the door without the sofa. A narrow door presents you with some tough choices, and in this case, with just that choice. Jesus presents you, would you receive him as your Lord, 
If so, there are things you must leave behind in your former life. What those things are may differ in part for each of us. Some of you must leave your money, or at least your love of money, behind. Others of you may have a relationship that you need to leave behind as you come to Jesus. For some of you, there is a cherished sin. Many of you must leave your self-righteousness. You come to the door, and the door will not let you enter with all the baggage of a sinful or a proud heart. You must lay it down. You have to give it up, or you will never fit through that door. You have to leave your reputation. You have to leave a friend or two. You have to leave your family. You have to leave your ego. You have to leave your money, all of that behind. Now listen, the Lord may restore some of these to you as you come through the door. Sometimes He does that. He may give you even more of some of that stuff that you left behind when you entered. That you do not know, but you can be sure that you will never enter the way of life until you have laid them down. Martin Lloyd-Jones said there are two main things you must leave behind when you enter the Christian way. The first, he says, is worldliness, the way of the world. You know, that's, that's so popular and so easy. He says, when a man becomes a Christian, he first begins to see himself as a separate unit in this great world. Formerly, he had lost his individuality and an ident- Formerly, he had lost his individuality and identity in the great crowd of people to whom he belonged. But now he stands alone. He had been rushing madly with the crowd, but he suddenly halts. He says that's always the first step in becoming a Christian. He realizes furthermore that if his soul, his eternal destiny, is to be made safe, he must not only stand for a moment in the surge of that great crowd, he must separate himself from it. He may find it difficult to extricate himself, but he must do so. And while the majority are going in one direction, he must go in another direction. He leaves the crowd. Lloyd-Jones continues, you cannot get a crowd through that turnstile altogether. It only takes one person at a time. It makes a man realize that he is a responsible being before God, his eternal judge. The gate is straight and it is narrow and it brings me face to face with my judgment. It brings me face to face with God, the question of life and my personal being, my soul and its eternal destiny in quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. Those are the things the crowd does not face. You face them alone. It isn't easy to turn your back on the world. You will be looked upon as odd or crazy by some. You will find yourself in some awkward social context, but understand this, you either leave the world behind or you take it with you in the broad way. You grew up like me, you probably sat around some campfires singing a little chorus. The world behind me, the cross before me. Remember that? The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Second thing Martin Lloyd Jones says you must leave behind is yourself. Well, that sounds odd, but what he means is that you must leave your pride and your selfishness, the demand to rule your own life. When you join yourself to Jesus, you pledge yourself to him as your sovereign Lord. Self-rule can be no more. Now, you don't have to obey Jesus. If you like, you can do your own thing just so long as you do it on the broad way, which is a nice way to travel if you're okay with ending up in the city of destruction. The options are not complex. It all hinges on where you want to to go. The choice is really very easy to make. I mean, easy in the sense that it's not complicated, but in another sense, the choice can be agonizing, and there we see we've returned to that word that begins the exhortation from Jesus. Strive, agonize to enter. You see now why Jesus used that particular term. He is not suggesting that you must go out and earn your salvation. You do not and cannot create the door that leads to life. You can't even open that door either. The door, brothers and sisters and my friends, it is already open and it's inviting you in. Eternal life is being offered. 
and it's being offered to you as a gift. What makes it tough is that the door is narrow and you must enter it alone, stripped down and bent over. You cannot puff your chest out in in pride and get through that door. You can't bring your dream house with you and get through that door. You can't bring your boyfriend with you and get through that door. That is, you cannot cling to these things. Again, I, I thought of how this paralleled a marriage. The man asks you to marry him. He offers you himself, all of his possessions, all of his loyalty for the rest of your life. It is offered freely. You don't work for it. You don't purchase him for a husband. But even so, the decision to simply say yes and to mean it, that decision can be very hard if you take it seriously. You leave behind all other possible husbands, suitors, men. You leave behind your own family. You leave the freedoms of singleness. You submit your life to someone else. That can be tough if you're serious about it. But when the bridegroom is Jesus, only a fool says no. Because Jesus is too wonderful. The options are too bleak. So the point of the text is to let nothing, nothing, nothing stand in your way. No sacrifice is too great to enter into this life. It may hurt you to lay aside those things and those sins that are as precious to you as right eye or right right hand, but Jesus, remember, said what about that? It's better to pluck out your eye and throw it from you, better to cut off your hand and throw it from you than to go into hell with both eyes or both hands. That can mean some agony, but the door of salvation we've read is narrow. Some of you today are still standing at that door. You may not have entered. You may be a member of this church, but you're still standing at the door listening in to what what is happening on the other side of the door. You're an observer but unwilling to enter because there is something in your life that you are not able to lay aside. Some, Some of you, I bet, could identify what that is. You won't relinquish some cherished sin. You you stand around the door hoping, hoping the door will grow wider. (laughs) The next part of the verse is for you, verse 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter, uh uh-oh, and will not be able. Jesus goes on to tell of how some will seek to enter when it's too late. And theirs will be a miserable end. We, we will look at the rest of this next Sunday. Jesus will let you in on the cost of your delay, on the cost of not entering the narrow door. He speaks to those who will stand on Judgment Day in agony because they chose the broad way. They did not enter in the narrow way. And the agony of the one who does not come to Christ ultimately is far, far worse than the struggles and pains of the believer. That's why Christ in love urges you today to enter that narrow door and be saved. Once read a biography about Harry Houdini, the famous magician and escape artist, and uh, don't remember a lot about it, but there was one thing that uh, really struck me because it kind (laughs) of, yeah, you'll see why. Uh, Harry Houdini, I'm told, in order to escape from certain places and certain bonds, taught himself how to temporarily dislocate his bones and his joints to get out of certain contraptions. That's why it stuck with me. I'm like, ah. I, I, I can't imagine doing that. That's pretty extreme. I thought of it this week as I considered what it means to strive to get through the narrow door. It means to go to any extreme to ensure that you will be in that unknown number when the saints go marching in. Does God need to dislocate your ego? Does not God need to dislocate your wallet or some cherished relationship? To make you fit for heaven, 
Jesus says to us today, let him. But do not let anything stop you. Give yourself no rest until you can say and say with confidence that you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you are on the path of his life. So let's wrap up today with a prayer and a prayer of commitment to walk through that door. Lord Jesus, we we believe that you are indeed the door and we come now to step through you into a life that is eternal and a life that is abundant. But Savior, we confess that our hearts They want to bring so many things with us. We want to bring our pride along, our possessions along, any number of things, Lord. We want to pull through that door. Forgive us and mercifully, oh God, sever those fatal connections to the world and to our pride. Draw us, gracious Savior, powerfully through the door into your arms that we might be yours completely and joyfully. Amen.